Hello everyone and welcome to the show. My name is Merlin Fulcher. Today is Wednesday the 10th of June. Uh, so lots more things have been happening in possibly about 24 hours ago. Uh, there was a, a big development in the ongoing uh, furore around statues and statues particularly of uh, imperial uh, slave owners in the United Kingdom. So this is a topic which um, obviously follows from the death of George Floyd in the United States, from the Black Lives Matter protests there and also here in the United Kingdom, and also um, what happened on the weekend with the statue of Edward Coulson being dismounted and then dunked into Bristol Harbour. And so what happened yesterday uh, was that the statue of Robert Milligan uh, was dismounted by the local authority Tower, Tower Hamlets in East London. And so Robert Milligan, uh, obviously it's not a very well-known name, just like Colston, Edward Colston, not a very well-known name. But what Robert Milligan did, he was a slave owner, and he was also somebody who built the West India Quay, the West India Docks, uh, which is an enormous uh, dock complex in East London. And this was built at its time, it was very high-tech, and it was part of uh, this trade triangle that effectively sold manufactured goods and then took slaves from Africa to the West Indies and then took those products from that region back to London where it was then sold to make enormous profits, uh, profits which were made through the exploitation, uh, through, the, through the death of so many people and brutality and uh, forced movement and expropriation of the products of their labour. So Robert Milligan... Um, he effectively was a part of advancing a very destructive part of human history. Um, and there was a giant statue of him, uh, this statue here that you can see, and it was in the Docklands. And it was on the quayside, uh, a pretty gruesome place actually. It's described as Blood Alley, which is something, it's actually in the inscription next to the statue, because uh, the men who used to carry the bags of sugar off the boats here, uh, the sugar was very heavy, it was very rough, and it basically cut their hands and backs, and so they would bleed. Uh, so it was obviously gruesome for the dock workers, but the, the, the origin of this sugar was also gruesome as well. So, so all in all, a, a pretty sad chapter in history uh, when you think about it. So um, in many ways, kind of surprising that this statue's there and the statue sort of appears to glorify him. And it's also, this is an area that's gone through massive change. So the, these, were, these docks were built for commerce, so they weren't really public places. And it's only in the last 20 or 30 years that they've been opened up and invested in and you know, put all this paving and bridges and quaysides. And it was all part of a major, uh, basically, financial services-led commercial office development, which we call Canary Wharf. So in the background, you can briefly see um, a whole load of offices. So the kind of biggest question is partly why a statue like this was being celebrated in that location. Now, what you can sort of hint at in this image as well is that there is water very near to this statue. And so what happened in Bristol with a statue being dismounted in a protest and dunked in the water was enormously possible here in London. And anybody who grew up in the 1990s can remember Get Your Own Back, uh, the show with Dave Benson Phillips, where uh, children would nominate a teacher or a parent or somebody uh, who would go through a load of challenges and at the end they would possibly get dunked in this gunge, the gunk dunk. And, um, you know, comically, perhaps, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we might see a few more statues getting dunked uh, uh, in, as we go through this chapter in our, in our history, uh, as we sort of review these landmarks. Um, which is something which is happening more and more and the Mayor of London has promised to do on a, on a big scale across the city. So in some ways Tower Hamlets didn't really have any choice. Um, this statue was probably going to get dunked in the water next to it, so they took the initiative and they removed the statue and I think it was gen gen generally quite well received. Now, I've done walking tours, uh, I've led walking tours of Canary Wharf, it's an area of massive importance, and so I've, I've, I've witnessed this statue and kind of pondered it and thought on it long before any of this incident, and it always struck me as a pretty gruesome thing, and this person is quite a weird person. Frankly, I would say a lot in Canary Wharf I find quite gruesome and quite weird and quite sort of unusual things to glorify, but that's another story. 
So for me, this makes sense. And I think Tower Hamlets were definitely taking the initiative here. And what you can't see in this image, basically roughly from where this photo is taken, there's a museum. It's called the Museum of the London Docklands. And it's a very, very important museum. And the name of this museum doesn't really let you know how important it is. The reason it's important is because it has a very gruesome, very detailed exhibition about the history of slavery. And this, I would say, if you're visiting London, if you're thinking what museum you should visit, I would say this is a museum, this is the most important museum you should visit in London, if not the United Kingdom. And also it's a very important museum uh, for the people of Britain, uh, for the people of London and for us all to sort of think about and um, and this is actually an important thing because it is actually, there is now a debate uh, and there's a campaign the mayor of London saying that there should be a national slavery museum um, now I would say so for example if you were to go and to visit a city like Berlin which was the capital of Germany during the Third Reich during the Holocaust during one of the most horrific chapters of human history um, you would probably visit the Jewish Museum. And um, it is a very important building. It's by Daniel Liebskin. It's a very interesting exhibition. Obviously, a lot of it concerns the Holocaust, but there are also other bits which look at other the parts of Jewish life before the Holocaust. And um, there's a lot in there. It's really worth seeing. But certainly, if you were to visit Berlin, this would be this would be very much in your kind of mental map of the museums and the kind of attractions and other things that are, are worthy and important to spend your time visiting. Now, in London... The Museum of London Docklands is not really up there, and that slavery exhibition is not really up there. I'm not trying to compare one to the other, but I'm saying that I think we possibly need something which is which is able to tell these important stories, but which is also properly signposted so people can properly understand and get to it. And we have a bit of an issue, really, frankly, in Britain and in England and in London, because we're not very good at dealing with these things. So here's a picture of the British Museum. And if anyone who's been to the British Museum, it's a really, it's a, it's a really fascinating museum. There's a lot of stuff there. There's a fair amount that tells the history of Britain. Uh, there's also a lot, really, the most visually striking and impressive and the most the things that most dominate this space as a museum are these various objects which have been taken some of them from the British Empire, some of the parts which weren't part of the British Empire, but it's basically a kind of collection of things which in many cases quite controversially have been taken and put on display in London. It doesn't, at an initial glance, it doesn't tell you a huge, huge amount about Britain. And and actually, you know what, there isn't really a history, uh, a museum of English or British or London uh, history, or sorry, there is a London museum, I'll come to that later. Um, so we've got the National Portrait Museum. It's okay. It, it really isn't. I mean, it, it's it's good, but it's it's not quite that important as a museum, frankly. Um, we've got the House of Parliament. Actually, has a lot of really important stuff in it. A lot of statues, a lot of paintings. We've got Westminster Abbey. Actually, it's not really properly understood, but Westminster Abbey is the most extraordinary museum of history you could imagine. A lot of statues in there. A lot of them potentially quite controversial as well. Um, you have to pay quite a lot of money to go into Westminster Abbey. Uh, when you're in there, there really isn't much interpretation to help you understand what you're seeing. I mean, there's a room in Westminster Abbey with the tomb of Queen Elizabeth I and the tomb of Mary, Queen of Scots, right next to each other. There's not a whole lot there to help you understand the significance of it. Um, and I think this is a bit of an issue. And I think also if you look at things like, for example, outside of London, in Manchester, we have the People's History Museum. Uh, in Reading, we have the Museum of English Life. But we don't have anything in London which really discusses these bigger issues. And certainly we don't have a National Slavery Museum. We don't have something which actually discusses the history of imperialism or anything like that. And although it does exist in this Museum of London Docklands, but it's not properly signposted. And, and actually, I think this is a bit concerning because, you know, I, I'm an architectural journalist, so I write about procurement, I write about culture, the build, the creation and the design of new cultural buildings like this one. So this is an extension to the British Museum. It's by uh, Richard Rogers' uh, partnership. Um, we've had a boom we had an absolute boom in London of, of construction of new cultural projects. So this is an extension to uh, the Tate Museum, uh, which was supported by the sugar magnate Henry Tate in its founding. Um, it's by Herzog de Muron. It's a massive multi-million pound extension. It was built during a period of enormous austerity where funding to schools and housing and various other things was cut. Uh, this project still went ahead. It's a huge art gallery. It has a really cool viewing platform, but it doesn't really deal with any of that kind of deficit 
of dealing of, of museums dealing with this cultural imperial legacy right it, and i would say it does a little bit of that stuff but it doesn't really do it in the way that something like uh the jewish museum does in berlin in kind of in addressing these quite important extremely important issues right so i think that's a, uh, uh, yeah and then and then there's been a lot of projects like this so this is again this is the tate britons there's another tate museum down the road new staircase by crusoe sinjin uh, sorry um uh, it is Crusoe, it is Crusoe Sinjin Architects, excellent architects, uh, New Stairway there, uh, and other projects. Um, this is the V&A, Victorian Albert Museum, his Museum of Design, massive new addition by Amanda Levitt Architects, plus various other additions that have happened over the last 10 years inside this museum. It's a museum of design, it's beautiful, it was um, it includes various items bequeathed by the royal family. Um, this is the Science Museum across the road, a new maths gallery by Zaha Hadid Architects. Um, this is the Design Museum down the road, a massive new museum by uh, John Pawson Architects. Uh, this is the uh, Newport Street Gallery, which is by, again, Crusoe Sinjin Architects for Damien Hurst, a private gallery, uh, stunningly <laughs> ambitious in its civic presence. Um, yeah, we, 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 there's, there's possibly more galleries and museums that have been built in the last 10 years that it's really possible for a visitor, let alone someone who lives here, to actually get around to seeing. There's even more, you can believe there's even more plans. So this is uh, the East Bank uh, on the Olympic Park. So this, this, this creates a new venue for Sadler's Wells. Um, Sadler's Wells, fantastic um, dance performance venue. Um, I possibly wouldn't think the biggest problem with London is there not being enough um, space for Sadler's Wells. I mean, I think Sadler's Wells is there, it's in Angel. Angel isn't even that far from the Olympic Park. Uh, you know, it seems like a bit of overkill. Uh, the University of Arts London, there's a BBC recording studio here. Um, there was originally meant to be a V&A edition here, but it's somewhere else. I mean, we're pretty, we're getting pretty saturated when it comes to, to cultural spaces, yet none of them address that key deficit of, 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 of saying, here's a space that deals with that kind of imperial legacy, that deals with all these really important topics that need to be addressed, especially in this age of the COVID-19, which has really exposed those massive structural and institutional injustices that exist in the United Kingdom. So having said all of that, I am optimistic. And one of the projects I'm optimistic about is this one. And it's the, um, uh, I was just wanted to say that this, this previous project is designed by O'Donnell and Toomey, who are an excellent architects. So I think this will be a good bit of architecture. Um, but then um, this is, here is the Museum of London. So this is over in Smithfield. Um, pretty much this is the kind of centre of London, Farringdon. Um, it, it's actually an old market for trading, uh, I think, meat products. Uh, and it was derelict and it was threatened with demolition. This project's kind of saved the building. It's going to turn it into a new Museum of London. I think the idea of a Museum of London, obviously I grew up in London, I live in London, I love London. I think a Museum of London is really important. Now, I just want to add that the Museum of London Docklands is part of the Museum of London. It's just in a different location, a satellite. So I would argue that something like the Museum of London, uh, this is a massive opportunity to address that kind of deficit, that deficit in interpretation that's really necessary. Uh, this is designed by Asif Khan and Stanton Williams, and the project's still very much in evolution. So even today, uh, they announced a, a tender for a design team to design one of the exhibitions here. I, I'm pretty hopeful that this is a place that can actually solve, um, or at least uh, play a part in, in helping with that interpretation. Not that interpretation is going to solve all those bigger structural and institutional imbalances that we have in the United Kingdom, but I think if we can go some way to having a space that tells that story, that isn't hidden under a kind of weird title like Museum of London Docklands, but Museum of London that actually can tell the story, you know, where the wealth of London came from, um, the issues to do with slavery, with uh, the imperialism and other things, uh, both near and far, and also the history of the working people, of all people, uh, that made the city what it is. I think that's really important. So I'm an optimist. I think we'll get through that. Uh, that's, my, that's my humble opinion on this. Uh, and hopefully uh, there'll be more interesting topics that I can discuss soon. Thank you very much for listening and watching. And good, good night.